ಓಂ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರುಭ್ಯೋ ನಮಃ ಹರಿ ಓಂ ಗಣಾನಾ ಗಣಪತಿ ಗುಂ ಹವಾಮಹೆ ಕವಿಂ ಕವೀನಾಪಮಶ್ರವಸ್ತ ಜ್ಯೇಷ್ಠರಾಜಂ ಸೀದಸಾಧನ ಶ್ರೀ ಮಹಾಗಣಾಧಿಪತ ನಮಃ ಸದಾಶಿವಸಂಭಾ ಶಂಕರಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಮಧ್ಯಮ ಅಸ್ಮದಾಚಾರ್ಯಪರ್ಯಂತ ವಂದೇ ಗುರುಪರಂಪರಾಂ ಆತ್ಮಸ್ವರೂಪ ಬಂಧುಕನ ಐ ವಾಸ್ ಲುಕಿಂಗ್ ಎಟ್ ದ ಸೆವೆಂಟೀನ್ತ್ ವರ್ಸ್ ವಿಜ್ಞಾತಾರ ಕೇನ ವಿದ್ಯಾ ಶಕ್ತ ವೇದ್ಯೇತು ಸಾಧನ ಸೋ ದಿ the player which holds to the objects which holds the objects the player you know the cutting cutting player whatever it a uh, tongs a pair of tongs it holds the object but there is a hand that moves the tongs this is one western philosopher tells a lot about this so the tongs that holds the object is moved by a hand and uh, this tongs cannot move that hand right so so vijnataram are kena vijaniyat i am the primary fact primary truth of this creation so there is the world as evidenced by i and of course god is also the god god is also uh, there when i wake up in sleep neither i am nor god is and i wake up and now i become a devotee and then there is the god so who is first whether god first or devotee first devotee first so i am is the primary fact of this creation and uh, i am doesn't need to be validated by any means of knowing by any means of cognition i am the primary fact doesn't need any proof in fact it proves everything else therefore vijnataramare kena vijaniyat that i have talked about it in some detail so then sa- sadhanantu ಶಕ್ತ ವೇದ್ಯೇತು ಸಾಧನ ಸಾಧನ ಈಸ್ ಜ್ಞಾನ ಸಾಧನ ದ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಕಾಗ್ನಿಷನ್ ದಟ್ ಈಸ್ ದಿ ಮೈಂಡ್ ಹಿಯರ್ ಮೈಂಡ್ ಇಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಏಬಲ್ ಟು ನೋ ಇಟ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ದಿಸ್ ಫ್ಯಾಕಲ್ಟಿ ಆಫ್ ನೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಎನ್ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟ್ರೂಮೆಂಟ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಐ ಟೋಲ್ಡ್ ಯು ದಿ ಟಾಂಗ್ಸ್ ಮೈಂಡ್ ಈಸ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಎ ಟಾಂಗ್ಸ್ ಮೈಂಡ್ ಈಸ್ ಎನ್ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟ್ರೂಮೆಂಟ್ ದಟ್ಸ್ ವೈ ದೇರ್ ಈಸ್ ನೋ ವಿಸ್ಡಮ್ ಇನ್ ಐಡೆಂಟಿಫೈಂಗ್ ವಿತ್ ದಿ ಮೈಂಡ್ ವಿ ಶುಡ್ ಯೂಸ್ ದಿ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟ್ರೂಮೆಂಟ್ suppose you have a crowbar or some such instrument you use it and they take care of it and put it in its place we don't identify with it we don't take it to the bed so we just leave it in its place mind is like that it is an instrument it's a very subtle though it's a means of cognition it's a tool of cognition and uh, so as such being a tool sadhanam sadhanam is a tool being a tool of cognition it can know what is before it that means the world it can know the things of the world with the help of the sense organs so but it cannot know uh, its own source namely the atma so the the essential reality of the individual cannot be cognized by the mind so naiva shaktam this uh, this vakya is a paraphrasing of the shruti vakya here uh, vijayananda swami is a, is bringing various shruti vakyas the statements of the upanishads so vijnataramare kena vijaniyat is also a statement from bruhadaranyaka shruti rest this is a, from kathopanishad naiva vacha namanasa like that the kathopanishad shruti is there the words so the words cannot describe the reality the atman you know how a word originates so there must be a form and uh, that form is cognized by the mind and corresponding to that form which is cognized by the mind 
a word arises. So, vacharam bhanam vikaraha namadheyam mrutiketheva satyam. So, this is the way the name and the form are interconnected. You have both of them always together. You cannot have one of them without the other. So, uh, uh, walk and manaha. Suppose, uh, suppose mind is able to cognize a form, then automatically the walk will, the mind itself will supply a name uh, because that is part of the cognition. So, and that name is uh, uttered by the organ of speech. So, if mind cannot cognize, then uh, words cannot describe because they always go together. Naiva vacha namanasa. Same way with uh, Mm, Taitri also. So, yato vacho nivartante, having said that, it is uh, incomplete unless you say the next thing also. Aprapya manasa saha. Now it is complete. Manaha is rupam. Vak is nama. Rupam is shape. Vak is nama. And so, they can grasp and they can cognize anything which is a nama and a rupa. Nama rupa or within the frontiers of mind and speech, but reality is nama, not Nama Rupa. It is not a name with a shape or a shape with a name. In fact, as long as this Nama Rupa Buddhi, what they call Nama Rupa Buddhi, Nama Rupa Buddhi means in our vision or understanding, we take whatever has a shape and a name as real. That is called Nama Rupa Buddhi. So, there are, there are two buddhis. One is Namarupa buddhi. Another is Bhogyatva buddhi. That means you look at an object with, uh, with the eyes of an enjoyer. The person uh, who is looking at the objects is an enjoyer. Just you imagine you are walking uh, along the aisles of Walmart. What are you there? What are you? You are an enjoyer. An enjoyer is walking. And therefore, he looks at this, he looks at that, and the, it is the enjoyer who is looking at them. Suppose sometimes you may walk along the aisles without being an enjoyer. That's okay, then you are not an enjoyer. But generally the example is that the enjoyer is looking at the objects. So now he looks at the objects with the, with the understanding, with the vision. The background vision is bhogyatva buddhi. Means this object is of use to me. Use means what? Bhoga only. So this is useful. Useful in the bhoga. Another name for bhoga is useful. So I can enjoy it. It can serve my purpose. So my purpose means what? The body-mind identified person's purpose, ego's purpose. So this is how we look at. So the Namarupa buddhi and the bhogyatva buddhi, they are there. Now suppose there is a thing called vairagya, viveka, they go together. Viveka addresses the Namarupa buddhi, Vairagya addresses the Bhogyatva buddhi. Both have to be nullified. Then only the truth will reveal. Until then, the truth won't reveal. It remains hidden. So, Bhogyatva buddhi, we, we nullify, we neutralize this buddhi, the, the, the vision, not vision, na, the way an enjoyer looks at things, that way of looking at things with a sense of enjoyment, that is neutralized by Vairagya. Then what is Viveka? Nama Rupa do not signify the truth. In fact, as long as you assume that whatever has name and form alone is real, you are not going to know the truth. Nama Rupa could at the, best, at the best signal the truth in a given situation. Otherwise, Nama Rupa has no more role to play. They are, it is an appearance that goes with a name and hence it is unreal. So that is the Viveka. Nitya Nitya Vastu Viveka. What is nitya, what is real and what is unreal, that viveka, that uh, neutralizes the namarupa buddhi and vairagya ihamutra phalabhoga viragaha. So that, uh, that a sense of uh, non-attachment, vairagya, uh, that neutralizes bhogyatva buddhi. Then you need not invite the truth, you need not bring it into, the, into yourself or any such thing. The truth will reveal itself because the truth is you. So, the problem is Namarupa Buddhi and Bhogyatva Buddhi. So, the point here is, so, the mind and the organ of speech, they belong to 
this uh, the 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 sphere of nama roopa anubhoga they they can grasp anything within that sphere they cannot grasp the atma which transcends the names and forms and atma is not meant for bhoga no atma is not meant for bhoga the atmananda is not the pleasure of a self conscious ego it is not and therefore naiva vacha namanasa that shruti is brought out in that statement that finishes the 17th verse we now go to the next verse saveti vedyam tat sarvam nanyastasyasti vedita vidita vidita bhyam tat prathak bodhaswarupakam again this verse it captures the spirit of two upanishadic statements the first statement is from shvetashvatara upanishad in fact when you read the sentence immediately the upanishadic statement flashes it is like that because it is a paraphrasing the statement the original statement is paraphrased by the poet just by changing a few words here and there so that it fits into the matter so saveti vedyam tat sarvam tat brings in yat yat vedyam tat sarvam saha vetti whatever is to be known that is known by the atma or to the atma saveti saha is atma in fact the shvetashvatara vakya says saveti vedyam nachatasyasti vetta that is the shvetashvatara vakya it it is seen there almost identical nanyaha tasyasti vetta that anyaha is an extra word so atma it knows the entire jagat it knows atma knows you see i remember a very interesting event in bhagavatam one story dhruva was a devotee he was doing a very severe penance he is a young boy but he performed a very severe penance for 6 months and he penance is contemplating upon the lord lord vishnu or ishvara so he is in samadhi means no food nothing he is like a, a statue sitting there a breathing statue nothing more than that for days on and so like that he was in samadhi the mind was uh, as to frozen with one thing in it that is ishvara that is the total concentration and now ishvara came ishvara he is contemplating upon ishvara in a particular form so ishvara appeared in that form you know ishvara appears in whichever form you contemplate ishvara that is uh, that is how it is because ishvara can appear in any form because essentially he has no form so he appeared in the form in which this young boy was contemplating and ishvara appeared but then ishvara is waiting there this boy is still continuing with his penance and now so now ishvara it is now ishvara's ishvara is at the receiving end in a way he has to make himself known then then only the purpose of his appearing there will be served whereas this young boy he is so absorbed in his uh, meditation that he doesn't know that ishvara is before and he doesn't recognize ishvara and therefore this poor ishvara is standing there so that means now you know who is first <laughs> really and then what ishvara does, that is the story then what ishvara does is he has a conch ishvara lord vishnu holds a conch in his hand again kanch is a symbol everything is a symbol so kanch symbolizes the knowledge of vedas that is what it symbolizes because all the four vedas have originated from the divine sound om and the kanch it if you blow the kanch the sound that comes out it resembles the divine sound om so you can take it that way there may be an elaborate method of explaining the connection between kanch and knowledge this is a very short cut method so kanch so this kanch he he takes 
uh, he says there, the poet says, Kambu Maye, na? Uh, like that, the, the Vedic knowledge, which is in the form of the conch. And so this conch, uh, with that, he touches Dhruva on his cheek. He touches like that. And with that, Dhruva's meditation is broken. The, that uh, absorption is broken. Now Dhruva was surprised. Why his uh, concentration was broken? And he opens the eyes. And now he cognizes Vishnu. Then Vishnu is there. Till then Vishnu has to wait for getting validated by this cognizer. <laughs> that is how it is. Really. Therefore, uh, Savetti Vedyam, you the Atma, you know everything. Savetti Vedyam, whatever Vedyam it is, yet Vedyam Tatsarvam Saha Vetti, na Tasyasti Vetta, that Atma cannot be made an object of knowledge by some other agent of knowing. There is no, no another knower for that Atma. You see, uh, suppose there is Ghatta is there. Ghatta is validated. Ghatta doesn't say I am Ghatta. Ghatta is part. Ghatta doesn't say I am part. A conscious being has to say that it is the part. So, Ghatta is validated by what we call Ghatta Jnanam, the knowledge of the part. So, all existence in this universe has to be validated by a cognition. So, the Ghatta Jnanam validates Ghatta. Then, then who validates Ghatta Jnanam? Jnanam. Jnanam doesn't need any other validation. It is self-validating. Because in the philosophy, we don't accept jnana for jnana. Jnana jnanam we don't accept. Ghatta jnanam we accept. But jnana jnanam we don't accept. Whereas Indian logicians, they say jnana needs to be validated by another jnana. Jnana jnanam. Ghatta jnana jnana. Then uh, if you apply the same logic, then it goes to infinite regression. You can easily see. So we say all names and forms are validated by the Atma, which is a Jnanam. Atma is the Jnana Swarupa. Satyam Jnanam Anantam Brahma. It is a Jnana. And uh, Atma being a Jnana, knowingness, it doesn't need any validation by another agent of cognition. Nacha Tasyasti Vetta. You see, here, uh, the point here is, uh, the goal of philosophy the way we look at it, is not intellectual exercise. That is not what we are doing. Sometimes it may look like that, but it is not that. The goal of philosophy is not gymnast intellectual gymnastics. And also, philosophy doesn't believe in dogmas. It is not interested in a set of beliefs or dogmas. The, the Upanishad it questions the truth and validity of our sense knowledge. That is how the Upanishad proceeds. You see, we have knowledge uh, acquired in two ways. The sense knowledge and the knowledge gained by a mind, which is disciplined. A disciplined mind that we are talking about. The, knowledge, the mind which is logically disciplined or scientifically disciplined mind. And so, this is the knowledge that we have. This knowledge is questioned, its validity is questioned by the Upanishads. Upanishads say, do not take the knowledge of the senses and of the disciplined mind or rational mind straight away as the ultimate truth. No. So, this knowledge of the senses and of the disciplined mind is considered as relative knowledge, aparavidya, by the Upanishads. It is not taken as absolute knowledge. So, there is a thing called absolute knowledge and uh, what all knowledge that we gain with the uh, senses and the disciplined mind, disciplined I am saying, a highly disciplined and a trained mind, that also it can acquire some wonderful knowledge. So, all that knowledge is uh, still relative, however great it may be. So, uh, that means what? The science, the entire physical uh, science, it is the knowledge of the disciplined mind, this uh, science is also knowledge about names and forms only. That's why the physical science is a study of names and forms. That is, that is what it is. 
whereas uh, the upanishads or philosophy is a is a study of reality and uh, so the scientific knowledge or the knowledge of the senses and the mind is the aparavidya it is relative knowledge to put it bluntly it is the knowledge of the shadows that is what it is entire na na again uh, put something uh, in somewhere else you can do like that but uh, we we do this way also this is one way of looking at it it is the knowledge of the shadows and there is no substance in that knowledge so the knowledge of the mind and senses is knowledge of the shadows without any substance there is a higher knowledge paravidya para means higher or superior knowledge paravidya that knowledge it is a uh strictly speaking it is a higher it is a higher form of awareness because there is no particularity associated with it it is all knowledge is particular because it is the knowledge of names and forms the names name and form it defines and limits the knowledge itself whereas the higher knowledge is not defined and limited like that therefore it is the knowledge of knowledge in the form of awareness and in this awareness the knowledge and the experience become one so whereas in this sensory situation what you know and what you experience there are two different things the experienced is outside and the experience, the the experiencer and the experience are within this kind of within without division persists whereas in that higher form of awareness in paravidya the knowledge the knowing the knower and the known the merge the coalesce and so uh, to put it in a different language the experience and the knowledge they become one and uh, this higher form of awareness this is the paravidya it transcends the transient and the relative so that is the meaning of saying saveti vedyam tat sarvam nanyas tasyasti vedita that atma is that higher form of awareness and hence nobody in, there is no agent which will in turn um, objectify it uh, in a in a piece of knowledge that is not going to happen so that is how we understand that statement you may wonder it is all said earlier I, i as i told yesterday it is said earlier but we say it again the language differs the way we look at it differs and it needs to be repeated like that it is not really not a repetition uh, then the second vakya vidita vidita abhyam tat prathak bodhaswarupakam so this is something very very critical and very important <laughs> you see vidita is known avidita is unknown so what is atma which in which category you will put it is it vidita known or avidita unknown it is neither vidita nor avidita you may just stay with those two words so vidita and avidita vidita known avidita unknown in fact once again the vijar the poet vijarani swami he is paraphrasing a sentence from keno upanishad so the sentence is anya deva tad viditat atho avidita dadhi tat tat atma that reality tat atma i mean tat brahma saha atma doesn't matter so that reality viditat anya deva it is indeed uh, distinct from what is known so that means immediately it may uh, look as if atma is the unknown because anything which is not known or distinct from known uh, you, you see the negation and anyat na and anyat they, they mean the same the negation has the meaning of anyartha so when you say anashvaha non not hars means it is something other than hars so na has the meaning of negation absolute negation so ghataha atra nasti that is absolute negation there is no part here no negation and it can also mean another other than what is said therefore like a brahmanaha is a person only brahmanaha is na not non existence it is not shunya it is a person but a person who is not who is different from brahmana or anashvaha an animal which is different from uh, hars like that therefore anyatanna one and the same so anyadeva tadvidita 
when you say it is not the known, it is something distinct from the known, then is it unknown? No. Aviditat atho and also aviditat adhi. Adhi means not anyat. Adhi is another way of putting it. Adhi means upar. It transcends avidita. So, the shruti is a very critical there. It, it negates the vidita, but it doesn't altogether negate avidita. It transcends avidita. So, when it comes to vidita, uh, we straight away, with all force, we negate it. Because it is namarupa. Vidita is namarupa. Vidita means known. Known by what? Known by the senses and the mind. I tell you, the senses and the mind are very, very limited in their scope. So, I, I, I say with, without glasses, I cannot see what I see with glasses. It is as simple as that. The senses are, are very unreliable. Even in worldly things, even for namarupa's sake, they are very unreliable. Then the mind is highly prejudiced with all kinds of conditioning. Social conditioning is there in the mind. Cultural conditioning is there in the mind. And whatever you say truth, it is highly colored by at least these two types of conditionings. Social conditioning and cultural conditioning. You cannot rise above that. Very difficult. Uh, so, um, the, the, therefore, whatever is known is negated with a lot of emphasis. Anyadeva tadvidita. But when it comes to avidita, a little uh, respect is shown. Uh, avidita adhi. That is how I looked at it. Doesn't matter. It transcends what is unknown. The idea is like this. You see, uh, uh, the process of cognition that is either through the sense organs or with the help of the mind, or both. So, it is always both uh, when it comes to perception, and uh, in the rest of the cases, the sense organs do not play a very important role. It is mostly inference. Sense organs contribute something. Anyway, doesn't matter, you know it. So, put it uh, in simple words, perception and conception. That's it. It is all, it, uh, now everything is covered now. Perception and conception. So, uh, uh, the perception and conception, they divide this entire universe of Namarupa into two categories. One is Vidita and the other is Avidita. Vidita is also Namarupa, Avidita is also Namarupa. Because uh, when you negate something, suppose you, you show something and say, it is not horse. That doesn't mean uh, it is a part. It is not that kind of a negation. When you say it is not horse, it is still an animal only, some animal which resembles hearts, but it is not hearts, like that. That is how negation is applied. There is no absolute negation. When you say nothing, it has, it is, it is, it is uh, relative to something. In fact, of the same jati also. The jati also must be the same. Then only negation will work. You cannot uh, show the book and say, this is not, this is a, a non-part. Like that you cannot say. You can show a cup and say non-part. Some such a jati must be there. Therefore, the, when you say known, it is in the, within the frontiers of senses and mind. And when you say unknown in that, in that way, something other than the known, avidita, which is also within the frontiers of the senses and the mind. Therefore, you see, it is like this. Uh, in the West, for a long period before the arrival of Immanuel Kant, you know, so uh, the philosophers they were uh, they, they were following the doc a doctrine called doctrine of pure reason. That is the doctrine. So that means what all is there to be known to be understood in this creation, it is known through the senses and the disciplined and the trained mind. That is what is called doctrine of pure reason. Okay, a person who is not trained properly, he may not know higher things, but a, a disciplined mind, a trained mind can know the truth. And uh, senses by themselves may not see everything, but if you assist the senses, enhance their power, like for eyes, you enhance the power of seeing of the eyes with a telescope or a microscope, you will know the entire universe, there is nothing more to be known. 
So this is called a doctrine of pure reason. Whereas Immanuel Kant arrived on the scene and his philosophy is called a critical philosophy. Uh, because uh, what he says is uh, he doesn't accept the doctrine of pure reason. In fact, he criticizes the reason itself and uh, what is known through reason, reason including the senses and the mind. That is what reason is. It includes the senses and the mind. So, he says the domain of the reason itself is limited and uh, you cannot say uh, the reason has uh, every answer to the entire uh, issues of human existence. You cannot uh, say like that. You cannot give that kind of a highest pedestal for reason. It is not possible. In fact, I tell you, the fundamental principles upon which all knowledge that we acquire, uh, uh, so the, those principles are based, uh, so they are known. And uh, it is, uh, it, uh, they, they are uh, adopted purely by the intellect. So, this is how uh, human mind functions. Uh, and then, uh, the, in the doctrine of pure reason, they say human mind is like a blank sheet waiting to be filled with information through experience. And therefore, whatever is experienced through the senses by the mind and whatever mind comprehends, that is all that is there to know. It may not be one mind. You put a few minds together, great minds, and now you have known what all you have to know. And if something else is to be known, still pending or waiting to be known, then the human mind will know it eventually. This is the doctrine. This doctrine is not acceptable. So Immanuel Kant talks of what is called reflexive analysis. That means the subject, instead of analyzing the objects of the world and trying and say that I have known, the subject what he does he tries to analyze itself. The subject analyzes himself. So, the question is raised. You see, suppose there is an experience, a sensory experience is there, and knowledge is there. You understand. So, you see the part and understand the part. So, what is the nature of this knowledge? You see, what Kant says is, uh, the knowledge of the part is not entirely the product of an experience, sensory experience. The knowledge of the part is an outcome of synthesis of this experience with, together with the fundamental structures that are already present in the mind. And he gives a list of structures. For example, time, when you see the part, you see the part in the now. In the present you see it. You never see it in the past or in the future. You always see it in the present. And the present, the time sense associated with the experience, that is provided by the mind, that is not there as part of the experience, sensory experience. I see the part and the mind fills, the mind provides the time principle. So I see the part now, that now is not part of sensory experience, that now is provided by the mind. And the space also is a category of the mind only. So the mind has this framework already in place. It is not a blank sheet as it is uh, assumed in the case of uh, doctrine of pure reason. It is, uh, uh, it has got a structure of principles already in place. So one of them is time, the other is uh, a space. And then uh, cause-effect relationship, the principle of causality is provided by the mind. It mind, is, uh, mind provides it. The moment you see the flower, it is not the senses which tell you that the flower has a cause and that cause is the plant. Senses do not bring the principle of causality into the picture. The principle of causality is a contribution of the mind. The mind contributes because it is the mind which has this cause of principle of causality fixed into it. So three categories which we talk all the time in Vedanta, the mind has three categories fixed in it. It works on the fundamental framework of space, time and the principle of causality. Now, any sense experience that you gather through the sense organ that is synthesized with this framework and the result is knowledge. This is how it happens. And one more principle is there. The principle of plurality, this is what Kant says. When I see it, I am amazed how beautifully he anticipates, he, 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 uh, he concludes 
what the Upanishads have told all the time. He says, the principle of plurality, it is not a product of pure sense experience. Because uh, there is a principle in Indian logic, which also Kant says, the principle is, uh, eyes do not see, it is the mind which sees, you know, whenever eyes see, it is the mind which sees through the eyes. Therefore, let us say the mind. The mind never sees two objects at a time. That is a law. There is a sutram by uh, Nyaya Shastra, in Nyaya Shastra by Gautama. So, if, the, if you see two fingers, you are not, the mind cannot see both the fingers simultaneously. It cannot. It has to see this finger first and that finger later. Or first this finger and then that finger. At the same moment, it cannot see both fingers. It can see one object at the same moment. And now, the, if that is the case, then the sensory experience provides unit knowledge, at a, a unit information at every time. It doesn't provide a, the sense of plurality. The sense of plurality is a contribution of the mind. It is not the contribution of sensory experience. Because mind functions based on memory. It sees this and then it sees this next finger and then connects them by memory and then projects the idea of plurality. Therefore, the idea of uh, duality or plurality is a contribution of the mind, a conditioned mind. Space, three-dimensional space yeah, and volume is a contribution of the mind. Time is a contribution of the mind. So like this, mind and senses put together, they synthesize knowledge. Knowledge is not a unitary process. It is not a single thing. It is, of course, a unitary process by bringing together the sensory experience with the fundamental framework of the mind. This is how the knowledge happens. So, saying that this is the summum bonum, this is everything of knowledge, it is not acceptable. So, Upanishads say this knowledge which is synthesized by the mind through the senses, it is very limited and uh, it cannot, uh, it cannot, uh, it, it is not exhaustive. It does not include the source of this entire process, the awareness which is Atma, it doesn't fit into this process of synthesizing knowledge. And therefore, Atma is beyond this process and therefore Atma is beyond the categories of known and unknown. That is how we look at it. Uh, I, I try to provide some uh, kind of uh, philosophical basis for this statement, Vidita Vidita Abhyam Anyata. And uh, the Upanishads were saying this all the time. What Kant has arrived at much later. So, in fact, you know what Kant says, he, he, he is a critic of reason, the critical philosophy, he, he named it as a Copernian, Copernian revolution. You know what Copernicus did? Uh, before Copernicus, people thought that earth is in the center and the sun is going round the earth. The Copernicus put this whole theory on the head. He reversed it whole, uh, altogether. He put the sun in the center and earth, etc., going round. So, he just turned the philosophy that existed till that point on its head. That is what Copernicus did. And uh, so, Kant says, my philosophy is like that. Because in the doctrine of pure reason, all knowledge has its uh, origin in the world. Only you need a blank mind, uh, like a blank slate. It is a blank mind, ready to receive the knowledge, highly trained and refined, and the sense organs, so you have known what all has to be known. If something is there, the human mind will know it. This is the doctrine of pure reason. This is just turned on the head by Kant, by questioning the reason itself. The reason is not a sacrosanct, it is a synthesis. And therefore, uh, it is highly dependent upon the structure of the mind, the samskaras of the mind. In any case, it doesn't exhaust the domain of knowledge. So, anyway, uh, I don't know whether I made a, a big deal all about it. So, uh, in my enthusiasm, I have done it. doesn't matter. <laughs> Coming back to the thing. So, vidita vidita abhyam tat prothak. Atma is neither the known nor the unknown, it is distinct, prathak. So, it is bodhasvarupakam. 
You see, here I would like to say one more thing. The language that is used in uh, describing the Atma, uh, we have to understand it. Because uh, we say Atma is not available for description with words. We, we say it in so many words. So, yato vacho nivartante naiva vachana manasa and Shankara says pratar bhajami manaso vachasa magamyam. So, I contemplate upon that reality which is not available for the mind and the uh, walk, etc. So, like that. So, in this context, and here we have this uh, statement, very, uh, very, uh, I mean, weird looking statement, uh, enigmatic statement, vidita vidita bhyam anyat. So, in this context, I would like to say, you see, language uh, has its limits and uh, it has its glory also. You see, suppose you, you take the language of the marketplace. It is very rude and very crude. And uh, when you go to a scientific laboratory or a class of philosophy or whatever, uh, any, any uh, university classroom, there they use uh, an altogether different kind of language. Very refined language and very appropriate language they use. So there is such a big difference between the language uh, when you compare the marketplace versus a classroom in a university. Now, when you come to the Upanishads, the long, here, uh, here we have to describe the spiritual reality. It is uh, the language of a classroom is, is used to describe the sensorial experiences under the inferences of the mind. That is the language, very refined, all right. But when it comes to Vedanta, that language, that exactness of the language is not enough. Because here uh, you have to describe uh, the plane uh, of not of uh, sensory knowledge. Here the plane is uh, that of uh, spiritual experience or spiritual being. Experience in the sense you are with the, you are identified anubhuti. So in that sense I am talking, not the normal experience. So even the most purified, the most refined language fails to describe the Atman. So the language that serves very well in the, in the worldly, uh, in the knowledge of the universities, etc., it fails to describe the Atman. Similarly, thought. For the marketplace, you need a kind of thought. But when it comes to a university classroom, physics or chemistry, that kind of a thought structure is not enough. You need to refine the mind, train the mind further. But when it comes to the Atma, so the thought, no matter how refined it is, no matter how much trained the mind could be, the thought fails to grasp the truth of Atman. So, you see, what is thought, you know? Thought is a, a, a response of memory to a stimulus which is outside. You see something and a thought arises. So that is the stimulus and the thought, it arises and it has the memory as its basis. Based on memory it arises. When you cognize the part, it is the light reflected by the part that falls on the retina and the resulting thought is a product of the memory all the time. So the thought is encased in, in the past, in the past experience, in the, in the, in the earlier samskaras. That is what thought is. So such a thought, which is a, a, a process in time, a moment in time, which is encased in uh, the past, is not going to grasp the reality of the Atman. So, but, so language under the thought process cannot attain the Atman. That is true. But yet, Atman is not attainable is not attainable through language and thought, but uh, what I wanted to say, Atman is not altogether unattainable. It is supremely real and uh, it is supremely accessible and attainable now and here. That is how it is. So, it is not known, it is not unknown, it is not uh, unknown, and uh, it is not known, it doesn't f f fall into those two categories, and uh, it is unknowable also, but still you can, you can access it, you can attain it, and you can be it.
because uh, the secret is uh, the trick is uh, it all happens to be yourself that is the trick that's why the word atma is used atma doesn't mean anything atma is not a thing sitting there atma means it is not different from you that is the meaning of atma ananya so as long as the human mind looks at the reality as though something different from me so aram ishat alpam api dvaitam so some it is something i am here that atma is something which i have to gain which is different from me which is away from me this kind of the duality the notion of otherness even an iota of it will act as an obstacle for the knowledge of the truth that is the idea so you see to talk about the part you need language you need thought you need senses to be what you what of the what are what do you need do you need language to be to become you need everything to be you don't need anything to think you need something you need a mind you need senses you need earlier samskaras vasanas memory all these things paraphernalia is needed but not to think i am not saying about thinking just to be do you need language do you need to think to be like descartes not necessary to be you don't need anything to be how much distance you have to travel being how far removed it from you in time or space so this is the central idea of what all we are talking vidita vidita abhyam so anyway what all we know through the senses and the mind atman is entirely different from all such things known and unknown so all our present knowledge will have to be turned aside in this sphere of vedanta all positive science becomes a science it is other than everything that is known then it must be something unknown and unknowable or it is altogether non existent no so it is a, uh, atman is beyond the categories of both the known and the unknown and uh, uh, so atman is not unknown in that sense because the world is divided nama rupas are divided into known and unknown so in that sense atman is not unknown because atman to put, now uh, i will uh, contradict what all i said now so atman <laughs> is uh, the most known of all because it is the drik the eternal seer the self of all the background reality of every experience sensorial or mental and uh, it is not an object of uh, it is not uh, something uh, uh, an item of objective experience all right but it is the self of the knower himself and as such it is more known it is, in, instead of saying more known uh, it is attainable and accessible now and here and uh, uh, so uh, that is how it is understood vidita vidita abhyam tat prathak bodha swarupakam so this statement uh, it is not the known and it is beyond the unknown it is always a, a difficult statement to explain uh, but then uh, anyway we have seen it to some extent uh, there is a shankara puts it in kenopanishad bhashya in a slightly different uh, way uh, i will say that also so that uh, it becomes complete you see shankara puts it in a, looks at the statement in a slightly different way very unique way he says uh, if it is known or unknown this known and unknown two categories he converts them into a different set of categories heya upadeya if it is known suppose known it becomes heya how 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 it is becomes neya, uh, heya you see for a viveki for the one who has the faculty of discrimination for a viveki whatever is known is nama roopa and hence unreal that is enough to say that it is unreal vacharambhanam you have a name for it and it has a form vacharambhanam vikarha is the form 
సో వచారంభణం వికారో నామధేయం మృతికేత్యేవ సత్యం దేర్ ఫోర్ దట్ ఈస్ నాట్ సత్య దట్ ఈస్ నాట్ ఇట్ ఈస్ నాట్ సత్య ఎనీ మోర్ సత్య ట్రూత్ ఈజ్ ఎల్స్ వేర్ సో ఇట్ ఈస్ ఓన్లీ జస్ట్ నేమ్ సేక్ నామధేయం నామమాత్రమేవ సో దెర్ ఈస్ నో రియాలిటీ ఫర్ ఇట్ అండ్ దెర్ ఈస్ అనదర్ స్టేట్మెంట్ ఇన్ ది ఉపనిషత్ ఐ విల్ కంక్లూడ్ ఇన్ టూ మినిట్స్ సో దట్ ఈస్ యద్ అల్పం తన్ మర్త్యం వాట్ ఎవర్ ఈజ్ అ స్మాల్ దిస్ ఈస్ ఛాందోగ్య సెవెంత్ చాప్టర్ యద్ అల్పం తన్ మర్త్యం యద్ భూమా తత్ సుఖం సో వాట్ ఎవర్ ఈజ్ స్మాల్ ఇన్ స్పేస్ అండ్ టైమ్ లిమిటెడ్ ఇన్ స్పేస్ అండ్ టైమ్ ఇట్ ఈస్ ఎ ట్రాన్సియంట్ అండ్ హెన్స్ ఇట్ ఈస్ నాట్ సుఖం అండ్ దేర్ ఫోర్ ఇట్ ఈస్ హే యా మీన్స్ దట్ విచ్ హ్యాస్ టు బీ రిజెక్టెడ్ నౌ ఈజ్ ఆత్మ హే యా నో ఇట్ డజంట్ ఫాల్ ఇన్ టు దట్ కేటగిరీ ఇట్ ఈస్ నాట్ హే యా బై సేయింగ్ ఇట్ ఈస్ నాట్ నో అన్న విదిత వి హ్యావ్ సెట్ దట్ ఇట్ ఈస్ నాట్ హే యా దెన్ దెన్ వాట్ అబౌట్ అవిదిత unknown generally human mind works like this something unknown is a, is a god or whatever you have to reach it it is always the unknown that you have to reach therefore if atma is not known then it is unknown and hence as such it has to be reached it has to be uh, got hold of upadeya you have to bring it uh, you have to take yourself there or you have to bring it to yourself whatever you have to gulf the bridge and somehow you have to reach there this is upadeya and so atma is not upadeya therefore as long as the effort the mental effort of trying to hold on to it or trying to avoid something it continues you are away from the truth so all mental because mental effort is always in the form of the opposites of raga and dvesha heya and upadeya so this is something which has to be rejected i have to throw it away and upadeya i have to grasp this as long as these two efforts continue the mental effort continues the truth remains away that is how he puts it it is neither heya nor upadeya then what is it it is yourself and just be that is how it is understood we'll come back om purnamad purnamidam purna purnamadachyate పూర్ణస్య పూర్ణమాదాయ పూర్ణమేవాశిష్యే ఓం శాంతి 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 హరి ఓం శ్రీగురుభ్యో నమ హరి ఓం దత్సత్ శ్రీకృష్ణార్పణమస్ఫూర్తి